I was buried before I even went to prison. I, I was buried then because the, 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 the level of corruption uh, that had engulfed me as a young man alone, um, you know, the, the book was written before the indictment came down. And, and, and that was really my reality. My reality was that I was going to prison for the rest of my life and it was nothing no one was going to be able to do about it. Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, BetterHelp, an online counseling company with the mission to make professional counseling accessible, affordable, and convenient. I hope you enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Impact Theory. I am here with somebody today that is going to blow your mind. I cannot overhype this one enough. Buckle in, we are here with somebody who has lived a life that you really can't imagine, Isaac Wright Jr. Isaac, thank you so much for joining me, man. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for having me. Dude, seriously, I, I could not be more just absolutely mentally mauled by your story. And it isn't even so much what you've been through, which we'll lay out for people quickly here at the top. It's how you approach problems. Um, so let's really fast. You were wrongly convicted of a crime in the early 90s. Uh, given a life sentence plus like an extra 70 years. So you're never getting out of jail. And I want you to pick up with um, who represented you in court. <laughs> I represented myself and, and, you know, not not because it was something that I wanted to do. I, I literally tried to find an attorney that was going to do right by me. But, you know, attorney after attorney uh, was coming in and was just telling me that my best alternative was to plead guilty you know, and take uh, 20 years for something I didn't do. And so my only course uh, was to represent myself. Really fast, would some of those people, if you had pushed and said, look, I get that that's your advice and you think that I'm gonna lose, but will you not stand and represent me? If you had said that, would they have agreed or you just knew their their heart's not gonna be in it, they're not gonna do what it takes? Oh, they, they were going to represent me and I was going to go to prison without a voice. And and, and that was, that was the, the issue was not um, the lack of representation, I would have gotten representation, but I would have gotten the kind of representation that would have sent me to prison for the rest of my life with no way out. Uh, because uh, at, at, at that point, I was going to be a slave to somebody else's strategy, somebody else's thought process, and uh, someone else's motives, you know, that passion and that drive and that belief. For example, I mean, this is very, very simple. If you don't believe in something, you're never going to be able to convince anybody else of it. And so that was really uh, where I found myself. I found myself uh, in a position where nobody believed in me. I was the only one that believed in me. Dude, it's so how old are you at this point? I'm in my 20s. And what's I'm, your I'm, educational background? A high school diploma. So here's a guy in his 20s with nothing but a high school diploma who decides that, okay, I've looked at my options from a representation standpoint, and I am better off representing myself, even though I don't know the legal system. That already, so one, because I know how your story turns out, um, I know that it's brilliant. In the moment though, I would have thought, I, I would have wept at your feet and begged you to take an attorney. And yes. so what, what was it in your mind that were you thinking I can learn this fast enough or or do you have to explain to us this idea of having a voice was more important than winning? Having a voice was more important than winning. Uh, and that that's how it initially began. Uh, but what happened is when I picked up that first law book, it felt like I was doing it all the time. There was an epiphany and and there was a there was a sense that I found myself. I'm facing life in prison. I came into the arrest and, and the charges and the indictment and all these problems thinking that I actually had it down, that I was on top of the world, um, you know, because I had a flourishing career and my ex-wife uh, at the time, her career was flourishing. So we were doing really well. And in a, as a 20 something year old um, a young man, you know, with a little, uh, little baby girl, a family, I thought I just, I thought I made all the right decisions. I had to pump the world in the palm of my hand and I didn't realize uh, until I went to jail that, you know, I, I actually found myself. I mean, that's where I found out who I really was when I picked up that law book for the first time. And, and, it, and from that point, my strategy began to change on how I was going to move through the system. 
All right, so I think one of the, um, just to throw out some more of the, the pieces of the story so we can get to the really interesting stuff. Uh, corrupt judge ends up going to jail. Yeah. Corrupt uh, litigator who ends up committing suicide. Like these, it wasn't like uh, this was just you were being over sentenced or something like that. Like you were in the middle of like one of the most insane and corrupt um, arrests and prosecutions I was Ever. completely I mean, the- surrounded, completely engulfed in corruption. And at every, I was, I was, and when you, when you look at it, I was buried before I even went to prison. I, I was buried then because the, 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 the level of corruption, uh, that had engulfed me as a young man alone. Um, you know, the, the book was written before the indictment came down. And, and, and that was really my reality. My reality was, that I was going to prison for the rest of my life and it was nothing no one was going to be able to do about it. That was my reality. The story that I would love for you to tell that will give people an understanding. So here we have a young guy in his 20s who's thriving, by the way. He's got his own uh, private record label. Uh, his wife is one of his musicians and is selling millions of albums. Like you're really doing very well, capitalizing on the, the rise of hip hop. Like you're really killing it, but only have a high school diploma get framed, railroaded in the extreme, and now take us to that moment where you're being sentenced and sort of how this like epic battle that that was destined to be on TV plays out between you and the lead prosecutor. So, you know, I, I obviously I, I get convicted. I, I go to trial and, you know, the trial is, um, it's about a month and a half, almost two months. And, uh, the jury goes, the jury's out for a week or so, and there's problems with the jurors and the judge tells them, don't, you know, get, go back in and don't come out till you find him guilty. And so they, they find me. He actually said five. that? Yeah. Yeah. He Whoa. said, that. he told him to go back. That's, and that's, that's public record. I think there's some, there's some articles online about that, but he, he literally told him to go back in and not to come back out till he found, because they had a problem. You know, this wasn't just a fight. This was a fight to the death. And I, I did everything that I possibly can, even though my strategy was not to get a, uh, an acquittal, you know, I gave them my best that I had. And, you know, they deliberated for a week. They came out and said, you know, we can't find him guilty. And that's what he did. He, he sent them back in. Uh, and they came back with the guilty verdict. Um, about about forty five days later, I'm sentenced, and so, you know, I'm, I'm standing up at, at during my sentencing. I'm you know I'm looking looking at the judge, and as the judge is is handing down my sentence, I notice that the prosecutor moves from his table. So I I kind of turn to look to see what's going on, and he's continuing to walk up towards the judge's bench, and and now the judge is actually sentencing me and and so that was really weird for me because i've never seen anyone uh at least a litigator uh, uh, an officer of the court moving around in the court going up through the gallery into the, in front of the judge and actually in front of his bench while he's he's talking it was a little disrespectful so i you know it caught my attention so i'm looking at him and my head and my eyes is following him up to the front and he stands right in front of the judge, right in front of the judge's bench where you can hardly, the, the bench is a little higher. So I can, I, he's covering the judge up to like his, his, because he, you know, he's a tall guy, but the judge was hiding him. So I was able to still see the judge's face. So he turns and he turns around when he gets to the judge's bench, he turns his back to the judge so that he can, you know, he can look at me and he timed it. He timed walking up to that bench in such a way as he was able to get there and turn around and look at me as the judge was handing down the life sentence. And when the judge gave me the life sentence, he started smiling at me. He wanted, he wanted me to see, he, it, it was important for him, uh, for me to see that not only did he defeat me, but he took pleasure in what he had done to me. And so, I looked back at him, you know, I looked back at him and I smiled back at him. And so we stood there. I, I, I couldn't, I didn't even hear what was going on anymore. I mean, after the last sentence, it was all a buzz anyway, you know? And so we stood there smiling at each other throughout the entire proceeding until the judge finished sentencing me. And then he walked off and walked to his table and shook hands and everything and patted everybody on the back and all of that. And then I was handcuffed and, and escorted out. Why smile? I knew why he was smiling. I smiled at him because I knew he didn't understand what really was happening. 
You know, I never, I never decided to represent myself to escape being sentenced to life in prison. I decided to represent myself because when I realized that I had a gift that I knew nothing about, uh, my strategy shifted to not going to prison because I was going. My strategy shifted to making sure that when I went to prison, they wasn't going to be able to keep me. And so everything I did was not for today. Everything that I did was for years down the line. You know, even some of the things that you're probably going to ask me about when I made new law while I was in prison, you know, I sat and waited for the right person for three years in prison. I waited for three years to get that right person to put this argument in. And I did it and I got him reversal. I used that case in my favor after I made the new All law. Right. That, that m movement was so brilliant. You have to explain to people why you didn't just use it immediately in your own case and like what it means to create new case law. I, I understood early on the corruption that I was facing, even before I picked up that law book, there was an incident that happened to me the day I was arrested and they took me to a holding cell in a jail to be processed before being transported to the county jail. Uh, the day I was arrested, I was in the cell and, and, and I kind of fell asleep. It might have been three o'clock in the morning. I kind of dozed off, you know, because I was arrested at, in the afternoon that day. And I'm still just sitting there in the jail and it's two, three o'clock in the morning. And, you know, I happened to, I, I think I dozed off because I heard my name and it, you know, I came to, and when I heard my name, I looked up, I saw uh, one of the detectives and a man in a suit coming towards me in the cell. So in my head, it was like, okay, a family member or a friend contacted an attorney and he's here to see me. So I got up and I approached the bars. And as I approached the bars, the guy in the suit put his hands through the bars and I started shaking his hands. And the, and the, 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 the detective that was escorting him and says, I just wanted to introduce you to uh, Somerset County Prosecutor Nicholas L. Bissell. And, and as he was talking, Nick Bissell says to me, uh, I wanted you to know, Mr. Wright, that I'm here to let to, to, to inform you that I'm going to be trying your case personally. Now, he was a head prosecutor. Head prosecutors don't try cases. Head prosecutors are administrators. Their assistants try cases. He gets out of his bed two, three o'clock in the morning to come tell me that. So even as a kid, 20 something years old, I understood that that move was something that was going to manifest himself itself in fact somewhere down the line because he was not going to turn against what he just said and he was not going to allow me to make him look like a fool. So I knew any, by any means necessary, I was going to prison. It was over at that point. Fast forward and I've been convicted, I've been, I've been sentenced and I'm moving toward, I'm moving through the system. One of the things that I knew from that experience is that the more I know about them and the less they know about me, the better off I am. For example, if they see me coming, they're going to cut me off at the knees. And so the entire strategy that I used was to formulate legal positions and to formulate the direction that I was going to go into gathering evidence against them without letting them understand what I was actually doing. I did a civil case and I fought that civil case like y'all, you guys did me wrong. I'm suing you. But the purpose of the civil case was to get evidence. I didn't care. I could care less whether I won the civil case or not. I could have cared less. I knew that a civil case was um, a door that opened you up to a fishing expedition for evidence and a criminal case was not. You know, and so I was fighting two wars on both fronts in order to stay 10 steps ahead of them without them seeing me coming. While they concentrated on keeping me in prison, I was gathering evidence against them right up under their nose and they had no clue what I was doing. Dude, it's so smart. And, you know, I always tell people to play the long game. And normally when I say that, I'm talking about reputation and, you know, be a good person and just think how these things knock on. But the thing that makes you so interesting to me, the reason that you've completely captured my imagination is that 
When you understand how the world works, the system works, the game works, whatever it is you're trying to play, and you don't act as if the world works the way you wish it does, right. you act the way the world actually works. works. And now when you do that, you can actually win because you're not right. fighting yourself, right? Right. And that you would go, okay, I get the game I'm playing. I get that this is gonna be a slow burn. You have the cojones to rock seven and a half years in prison. You wait three years to get the perfect case that matches yours, right? So you go to jail for being a drug kingpin. You see an opening to get that thrown out, but first you need somebody else whose case matches it so that you can get case law. So you give him, a. am not even sure what exactly you had to give him, um, but you give him something that he uses in his case. Right. I give him a legal argument. And so, so let me, let me explain to you. I, I lived my life uh, as two people uh, moving through the system. One person, um, his, his core motive was to wreak havoc through the judiciary. And when you, when I talk about, you know, getting people, 20 people out of prison, when I talk about while you the, were in prison yourself, while I was in prison myself, fighting for my own life, I set my fight aside to ensure uh, that I got uh, at least 20 people that were wrongfully convicted or sentenced uh, out of prison. Uh, during that time, I also litigated civil cases on behalf of the prison for prison conditions, mental, medical issues. You know, a guy would would leave and go to ad said he'd come back with broken arms, broken legs because, the, you know, the guards beat him up. And so and so that one person was the person, you know, fighting these these fights on behalf of others um, and, and, and being effective. That was a person that was wreaking havoc on the system. That was my core motive. That individual was to wreak havoc through justice, because one of the things about injustice if you fight injustice with justice, you wreak havoc upon injustice. It's like uh, uh, water and oil. It, it's never going to mix, you know. And so and so that's that was one of the things that that person that was his that was his core existence in life. The other person was the person who had an innate desire to right the wrong that was done to him. Uh, and and that was an entirely different fight from the fight that I was fighting on behalf of other prisoners. Because when I fought on behalf of other prisoners, I didn't have the worry about them seeing me coming. But when I fought on my own behalf, I had the emotional baggage that I had to manage. I had to be clandestine uh, in the way I was moving through the system and the things that I learned about the system and how I was gonna use those things against them. I had to be an entirely different person and so you had two distinct personalities uh, that was moving through the system at the same time in one person, and they cross collateralized those experiences to ulti to bring in uh, ultimate defeat through specific strategies um, that was laid out based on what that what I had to work with. You know, whatever it is that was in front of me, I, I, I use it against them. Talk to me about the emotional management. How did you recognize the need for that? And then how did you actually pull it off? Um, there was there was two things that I dealt with. And, and one, uh, I was in a good place with it because of something that happened to me when I was a kid, and that was fear. Um, something that happened to me when I was a kid changed the way I dealt with fear. And you open to talking about what that is? Yes. Um, and, and that was extremely significant because because fear is your greatest enemy. And when you're going through what I went through, you know, the average person, I shouldn't say the average person, the greatest of us is engulfed in fear when they're facing a life sentence or when they get a life sentence and then they go to a maximum security prison and there's dangers around them every day, 24 hours a day. But so when I was six years old, there was one day where my father was, was stationed at Fort Hamilton. And this was like on a Saturday, and I had just collected enough bottles because uh, I, I did that at least once or twice a week to have money over the weekends. As a kid, I picked the bottles up out of the ditches and go knock on people's doors and I collect bottles. And I had collected enough bottles that weekend uh, where I was I was able to buy you know my, myself some things from the store and, and some of my brothers. And so I was really happy that day. I was I was on my way to the store to spend some of that money that I made collecting bottles. 
And I remember skipping down the sidewalk, going to the corner store. And as I was skipping down the sidewalk, there was a dog, a German shepherd that was chained to a fence. And I recognized the dog because it belonged to one of the guys in the neighborhood. He was older than me. I think he was about 13 or 14 years old. Uh, his name was Peanut. And the, this dog was just barking at me as I was skipping. I guess he thought I was running or whatever, but he was just barking, barking. And I didn't pay him no attention because, you know, he was tied to, over the fence. So, so I continue to skip and maybe 20 feet from the store, it got silent. Subconsciously, the dog wasn't barking anymore. Mm. So I noticed it as I was walking through the store that the dog stopped barking. And, and when I looked over towards the dog, he was straddling a car. He was up in the air. He had straddled the car, jumped over it, and he was coming, he was getting on top of me. So he knocked, he attacked me, he knocked me to the ground. And as he knocked me to the ground, he was viciously pulling up and I was screaming. I mean, I was, I was horrified and I was screaming, help, screaming. And as I was screaming, I was slinging my arms and by mistake, I hit him in the eye and he screamed. And when he screamed, he backed up. And when he backed up, the owner came, Peanut came out of nowhere. Mind you, I think looking back as an adult, he was watching it. But when his dog got hurt, when he saw his dog get hurt, he jumped in and put his feet on the chain and then pulled the dog back. When I realized that I hurt him, something happened inside of me. And it was like, you hurt this monster as a kid. And it was by mistake, but what if you would have fought back? What could have happened if you had just fought back from the beginning instead of screaming? And so as a six-year-old kid, I understood the importance of fighting, fighting back no matter how, how much danger you're in. And so at that point, I dealt with fear differently. The way I dealt with fear uh, was more compartmentalized and was more controlled. And so and so the things that, were, that I could perceive to be more dangerous than me Never, ever again, I looked at it as something I couldn't defeat because I hurt this dog at six years old that had just attacked me. By the time I became an adult, I had mastered my ability to deal with fear and my ability to deal with, with, with confrontation and, and, and issues that I you know, uh, encountered uh, that were ultimately dangerous. And that allowed me to think clearly in the midst of uh, of anarchy or in the midst of caution, I was always able to think clearly. This issue with other emotions, however, I was no different than the average person. And, and, and how, you know, you got pain. That's, a, that's another very, very uh, difficult emotion to deal with. The, the emotion of pain and the emotion of empathy when you're seeing that what you're going through is also causing other people pain, you know, and you see the world that you built come crashing down around you uh, and you see all the people that you love suffering behind what you're going through. Uh, and, and so that was something that I never uh, had to deal with before in this way. Uh, and so one day now I'm in this prison cell and these things are happening to me. And I'm writing this motion. Uh, I fall asleep riding the motion. Uh, I may have been asleep for an hour or two uh, and I get back up. I wake back up, the papers are on my chest and everything in the cell and I pick up where I left off. And as I pick up where I left off, I'm reading what I had just wrote. I'm reading it and I set it down and start looking for the motions that I was writing because I didn't even recognize it was so emotional. It was so bogged down with emotional baggage. Even the way that I was articulating myself, it was hard for me to read. And so I knew that if I, it was hard for me to read, no one else was going to read it. No one was gonna pay attention to it. And I wasn't getting anywhere with it. And so at that moment, I had to figure out a way to become somebody else. I, I really, I really, became a third person. I, I, I That was a de defining moment for me on how I needed to, to, to separate myself 
from what I was going through in order to stay focused. And it took me some time, but I was able to master it. I literally became a different person. I was representing myself myself as someone else. else. And, and when I, when it became something that I literally mastered, I was unstoppable. The issue of my ability to deal with fear different than other people, and then now my ability to manage what I was going through, I became a beast. And, you know, at that point, it just kept, things kept, just kept falling in place, you know, month after month, year after year, they continue to fall in place until ultimately seven and a half year, years later, I opened the door to my freedom. Hey everybody, it's time to talk about all of our favorite subjects, mental health. Is there something holding you back or preventing you from achieving your goals or even just interfering with your happiness? Do any of you suffer from depression or anxiety? As a lot of you guys know, I've suffered from anxiety for years and trying to tackle something like that on your own is not always the optimal strategy but a lot of people are super nervous to try out therapy or they don't really know where to start or they're just plain embarrassed. But now there's a service called BetterHelp that makes therapy more accessible and affordable. BetterHelp is professional counseling done securely online using your computer, tablet, or mobile phone through video calls, phone calls, or text messaging with licensed therapists who are certified by their state's board to provide therapy and counseling. It is not self-help and it's not a crisis line. It's an online service available worldwide and it has a massive network of counselors who have a broad and diverse range of specialties. So you can get a counselor with the sort of expertise that might not even be available in your local area. BetterHelp assesses your needs and matches you with a licensed professional therapist within 24 hours. You can log into your account anytime to message your counselor. And BetterHelp also has group in our sessions every week where members can learn in groups directly from licensed counselors on multiple topics like relationships and ways to overcome anxiety especially if the thought of seeking help makes you nervous or embarrassed, be sure to check out the over 60,000 positive reviews posted on the BetterHelp site, and that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. BetterHelp is committed to making it easy for you to access the therapeutic help you need, even if you have never gone to counseling before. It's free to switch therapists, it's more affordable than local therapy, and they even have financial aid available if you need it. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit betterhelp.com slash impact. And again, that's spelled better, H-E-L-P. And join over 500,000 people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. BetterHelp costs just $65 per week and financial aid is available for those who qualify during the signup process. As an Impact Theory viewer, you can get 10% off your first month. So visit betterhelp.com slash impact and get the help you need today. All right, guys, if you need this one, please give it a shot. Take care and be legendary. Man, it's incredible. I heard somebody um, in an interview once say, you know, there was just something special about Mike Tyson because there were a lot of people that felt like they could win but Mike felt like he couldn't lose. Right. And that mentality that you just, you know, talked about, like of being able to smile at the corrupt, by the way, by this point, you know that you've been 100% oh, yeah. railroaded. They've got people pretending to be your employees that you've never met yeah. in your life. And you know you've been railroaded. You're you're facing down the system, which I can't think of anything more terrifying as a human. It's just, a, where do you push? Like, what what do you do? And it just seems so impossible to overcome that. And for you in that moment to smile, and I heard you once say he was smiling because he was in the moment. I was smiling because I was in the future. And sure. I knew what he was gonna have to deal with in terms of my willingness to learn the law, to get good at it, you know, and to be able to ultimately shut them down. And I wanna remind everybody, this ends with the judge going to prison and the prosecutor committing suicide because he was facing 10 years in prison for what he'd done to you and to other people. It's like, dude, it is the craziest victory ever of somebody who was just like ultra methodical. Now, I wanted to walk everybody through 
that story, which you've told many times before, but it's so important to understand one thing, which is once you understand how the system works and you don't give in to your emotion, I've heard you say you have to turn anger into action. So you learn how the system works, not wishing it were a different way because that's a waste of time. You learn it. And then you turn your, your anger, what could become bitterness instead, you make it usable. And then you go in like a fucking wrecking ball and you just you know create the chaos in the system. It's, it's extraordinary. Now, having said all of that and setting people up, when this like clicked into a new gear for me, it was when I realized you're running for mayor of New York. Yes. Now, as soon as I heard you explain why you think you should be mayor of New York, I was like, this guy isn't doing anything by accident. Why are you running for mayor? Why do you think you're the right person to be the mayor of New York? That's the right question. Well, you know, New York is in a, is in a in a state that it's never been in in its history. Um, you know, one of the one of the the, the craziest things that I ever seen in my life was driving into Times Square and it was completely empty. Times Square, out of every place else in the world, Times Square had fallen asleep. And you know, New York is a city that never sleeps, but it was sleeping, and it scared me because there were certain things that I knew about New York. And one of the things that I knew is that, you know, the city of New York and its mayor can't raise money. And with the deficit spiraling out of control, hundreds of thousands of jobs lost, I knew that the next mayor of New York City had to be someone special. It had to be someone that not only thought outside of the box, it had to be someone that can make the impossible possible. Because when you don't have money, you have no way to raise it. You have to ask the federal government, you have to ask the state, or you have to raise taxes, which that tax base is not there anymore. Thousands of businesses has, has gone, hundreds of thousands of jobs lost. Where's the money coming from? Uh, and so it, it dawned on me that I was at a moment in time in history that I can trace my life back to that arrest, the moment that those handcuffs was put behind my back. And that day in Times Square, I saw that as a sequence of events that led me down a road to this moment in time where I have, was pre being prepared to do that next incredible thing for the betterment of mankind. And when you look at everything that has happened to me, when you look at my delivery, I mean, my, my delivery from prison was a divine re delivery. It was divine. My God guided me through these issues and these problems, and he gave me a gift uh, in, in order to do that. And so my decision to run for mayor was based on the same reasons why I decided to represent myself, why I decided to help other people get out of prison, why after I got out, you know, I spent the next seven years pursuing a law degree. I was investigated after passing the bar for nine more years and waited it out. Those things did not happen to me for no reason. They were preparing me for my next biggest challenge. And, and, and I believe that next biggest challenge is being the mayor of the greatest city uh, in the world. So that even if it's four years, uh, when New York gets back on its feet, and it will under my tutelage, um, any mayor coming after me you know, we'll have a we'll have a small piece of pie to be able to deal with it when it comes down to the problems in New York. But right now, it's an incredible problem of a cake uh, that any mayor coming in is going to have, trying to eat all the issues and and uh, and uh, dissolve it in ways where it's palatable, uh, and so that the city can move forward. That's that's going to be an incredible monster for any person to come in as mayor and slay. And I think that I'm the one for the job, and I think I'm the only one prepared for that. Man, I, I will say this. I, I admittedly do not know who the candidates are that are running for New York, but I will say this. The way your mind works is all about problem solving. And so that's what gets me so excited. Help people understand, how is it that you think your way through novel problems? Um, 
it's that's a difficult thing to explain because it's a natural phenomenon and and you're seeing things different than other people so you have to not only know that you're seeing things different than other people you have to know exactly what it is you're seeing different so that you can identify that for them and they can understand where you're coming from uh so that's a complex thing to do but but this is the way that i can say it uh the, the way i deal with with what i see um i see everything in pieces uh, i'm very very detailed uh in, in the way that i understand the things that i'm that i'm experiencing with all of my senses it doesn't matter whether it's smell touch hearing seeing i i i i always take a granular approach to the things that i'm experiencing in life and the reason can why you i do explain that explain this, this can you explain that with the story of how you ended up getting out of prison the final puzzle piece because that to me is the most chill inducing example of your ability to break things up into small pieces okay so um so three years, three and a half years, almost four years before that incident happened, I had won a motion. The first it's ever happened, it's never happened again in, in the history of American jurisprudence, in the history of American law. As a, as a person serving life in prison, I won a motion that required the state to transport me from a maximum security prison to the prosecutor's office <laughs> and he was <laughs> never happened before this is the first time something like this has ever happened right and 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 he was forced to allow me to look through his files and I, and this is this is extremely important for you to understand what this means i am a prisoner i i, I went to i was escorted to the prosecutor's office in chains i duck walked my way into the elevator you know escorted by five or six cops and and, and law enforcement officers into the prosecutor's office when all these boxes in a room and I sat there all day looking through this man's files as an as a as a prisoner while I'm looking through his files I knew that he was going to sanitize it in other words I knew that he was going to take out anything that I may need so in my mind I knew that I had to find something that was insignificant but I had to look at it in a way that I know they weren't going to look at it so that I can use that insignificant piece, that insignificant piece of material, that insignificant piece of paper to entrap them in a way that was going to be devastating to them. So, so let me make that very much more simpler. So I found a piece of paper. It was an inner office memo. All it did was direct police officers to read the files in my case so that they could prepare for trial. That's all it did. It was one simple paragraph nothing crazy and that's why he left it in the file because it was nothing important there was four or five police officers that signed it so he left it in the files because it was insignificant they saw it as nothing as but an inner office memo when i saw it i saw that document as the document that was going to get me out of prison and and here's the reason why it was a two 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 full process and this is when you when you look at detail so i knew at that time that the detectives that was that was on that memo that had signed it that had read all the files in my case and had signed it if i asked them whether they read anybody else's files i knew they were going to lie you're back now i knew that they weren't going to tell the truth i knew it then when i the moment i saw that paper i knew i knew two things number one they weren't gonna if i ever got a chance to confront them they wasn't going to know that i had this paper and number two, if I ever asked him, them if they read the files, other files in the case, they were going to lie about it. So I knew that that paper was a credibility weapon. I knew that. So I went to the prosecutor and asked him, can you make a copy of this so I could take it with me? He said, yes. He gave it to me. He didn't see anything wrong with it. He gave me a copy of it. Okay. I waited. It took me another wait, almost four years for the opportunity to use that paper. Four years, right? So now, remember what I said earlier. I understood 
the significance of the paper from a credibility standpoint, that these officers, even though they signed this document saying that they read all the files in my case, if I asked them that on the stand, they were going to lie. And the reason why I knew they were going to lie about it is because they were going to protect each other. If I asked you as a detective on the stand, whether you, whether you knew of a discrepancy in another police officer's report, the moment you tell me I didn't read that other officer's report, I can't ask you about it anymore. In other words, I can't attack his credibility through you. So you're trained that if you're asked about any other report to deny ever reading it, because if you did, I can then ask you about it. So that was the atomic bomb for me, that one piece of paper, because I had the foresight to understand that they were going to lie. Here's the problem. Here's a real challenge that I faced. And this is this is the 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 the, the intricacies of understanding human nature and the way they respond to difficulty. There's a difference between challenging successfully a person's credibility and getting them to confess. That's totally different. So remember what I just said. I knew that I had a credibility bomb. The challenge was, okay, you, okay, you, you know, you challenged the police officer's credibility and you did it successfully, but you need a confession to get out of prison because your appeals is over. You still got these 70 years. You're going to be retried on the life sentence. You know, and that was an issue that I talked about before about um, making new law in this other guy's case and using it to throw mine out. So now that your appeals is over and you got one chance at this guy, if he doesn't confess, you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. So I needed a police confession. So this is what I did. And this goes down to detail. I took out every law enforcement file in my case, laid it out of my cell, and I did a psychological profile through their own reports on each one of them. And I chose one person because once that paper was out, everybody was going to know I had it. I only had one chance to introduce it. So I had to pick the right officer, the right police, the right detective that I believed if I got him in enough trouble, he was going to confess. So I did a psychological profile. I read the reports and the records over and over countless times for years. And I picked one person that I thought, this is the guy that's going to confess. So now I have to make sure that he not only, his credibility is not only challenged, but he's confessed, but he confesses. So seven and a half years later, I'm at this hearing. I'm at this hearing, I'm calling witnesses. And, and this is another thing you probably already know. At that hearing, before that hearing started, I was offered a deal, mind you, I'm seven and a half years in prison. I got the 70 years that I'm doing. My life sentence was vacated because of this new law I created, but the indictment wasn't dismissed. I was facing a retrial on that. So I'm facing a retrial on the life sentence and I'm still doing 70 years. And at that hearing, the prosecutor says, listen, we're gonna offer Mr. Wright a deal. He can't prove any of the things he's saying. It's all nonsense. It never happened. He's lying. Your Honor, you've read it. It's crazy. Nothing like that. And law enforcement would do none, none of the things ever that he's saying happen, happen. He's, he's just he's just got an ax to grind and he's making things up. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to offer Mr. Wright a deal so that he can be home in two years, so that he can start his life over again, get back and take care of his family and be a productive member of society. If he doesn't take the deal, we're taking him back to trial on the life and he's going to go back to prison with life plus 70 years. I turned it down. Okay. I turned that deal down. <clears throat> I would rather die in prison. I would rather have died in prison. I would rather have spent the remainder of my life in prison fighting to get out before I would give them another second of my life. They stole it from me. They stole seven and a half years of my life. And, you know, you got to think about what that means, because the people on the outside needed me. You know, my family 
they needed me um and and i needed them but the decision that i made was a decision of universal sacrifice and and this is and this goes back to when people choose their leaders you know as mayors it goes back to that if a person is not willing to make sacrifices and to sacrifice his life for the people he's he doesn't belong uh, to be the leader of the people and most people don't have that quality but not to veer off um i turned the deal down and we had this hearing and during the course of the hearing the judge is saying to me mr wright you turned down an incredible deal you have an uphill battle and you know i i want to be honest with you i don't see where you're going with this i mean i don't see you getting any leadway with the things that you've mentioned in your papers i said your honor you know I appreciate I appreciate that, but with with the court's indulgence, I'd like to just I'd like to continue, you know, uh, with my hearings. He says, "Well, no, you have a right to do that. Go ahead." So ultimately, Dugan came on the stand. The officer's name was James Dugan, right? And this is public record. James Dugan. James Dugan gets on the stand, and here's another detail. This this is about detail. So when he gets on the stand, he walks. He's walking to the bench. I finally call him. He's walking to the witness stand. I noticed that his clothes, his uniform was different. And that bothered me. I needed to understand why is your uniform, why do I not recognize your uniform? I'm in prison seven and a half years. I've been dealing with law enforcement on a very, very intimate level in order to understand the system, in order to understand how law enforcement works, in order to understand the culture of law enforcement. And I've never seen that uniform you're wearing. So that's bothering me. I need to understand it. The very first thing I did was ask him about what he was wearing. Officer Dugan, I noticed you're uh, you're in uniform today. Yes, yes, Mr. Wright. I've never seen that uniform before. Can you explain to the court, you know, what's your what's your job description now? What what police uh, department you work for? He says, Mr. Wright, I don't I don't work for a police department. I am chief of the police academy. Okay, so seven and a half years later, this guy goes from a mere detective in the prosecutor's office to running the entire police academy. Well, because I pay attention to detail and ask that question, that was a God sent for me. And here's the reason why. I know you're getting ready to lie to me. I know I, I haven't asked you this question yet. But I know you're going to lie. So guess what I'm going to do to you? I'm going to build you up to make you look like an archangel police, like God's own divine gatekeeper. I went through his entire career and showed the court through him that he was not only a man of honor, his integrity was impeccable. He was a, a God sent when it came down to police work. And it showed in his rise in his career. And the moment I got him way up here, I got him so far that I couldn't even reach. I asked him that question. Did you remember the discrepancy in Detective Race's report? He said, Mr. Wright, I didn't read Detective Race's report. Mind you now, I got the document that says he read every report. I don't stop there. Then I asked him, what about... Uh, what about Detective Buckman? Did you read his report? Mr. Wright, I didn't. I went to three other police officers. And he just says outright, Mr. Wright, I didn't read anyone's report but my own. I write my report. I read it. I pass it on to the sergeant. So I asked him three more times until I get an objection. Objection. The judge screams on me, Mr. Wright. It's asked and answered. It's clear to this court that this detective has read no other report but his <laughs> own. Okay. Mind you, I need a confession. I need a confession. This is detail. This is this is not only understanding the details, but knowing how to pick those details apart in pieces and use them just like an, uh, an atom. Think about this for a second. The energy in an atom, a single atom, the things that we can't see can wipe out the entire earth. The small details, the power in details, the smallest ones, can wipe a man out. So when I got that objection and the court said on the record that he didn't read any other report based on his testimony, I pull out the piece of paper that I pulled out 
that document. Do I present it to him? No, I don't present it to him. I need a confession. You know what I do with it? I turn it around. I put it behind my back and I turn it around so anybody standing beside be, behind me can read it. So it's like this. What do I do then? I walk in front of the prosecutor's table so he can read it because I want him to know what I'm getting ready to do to his police officer witness on the stand. I need him to know first. And you can't do nothing about it. You sat in here all this time and you listened to him lie. Now what I'm doing is I'm going to show you what I'm getting ready to do to him. And the reason why I'm showing you first, not only can you not do nothing about it, the sign language is going to go back and forth. You know, I do all kinds of things back and forth on the stand. <laughs> You're going to have to warn this man. <laughs> you understand? You're going to have to find a way to warn him what's getting ready to happen. But what you don't understand is that in warning him, the only thing you're going to do is put him on alert and he's not going to know why. That's all you're going to do. That's exactly what I want you to do because I need a confession. I just don't need. I'm starting with this confession with you. You're my tool. You don't even know that I'm using you. All right. So he's reading it. While he's reading it, I got it behind my back and I'm in front of him. He's sitting down reading it. While he's reading it, I'm asking the detective on the stand more details. And he's and the detective is trying to look around me at him. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's working. Everything's falling in place. So I stepped to the side and I said, excuse me, detective, do you want uh, you need to speak to the prosecutor? Something that you want. Uh, you want to say, I, you know, I'm asking you questions, but you're looking at the at the prosecutor. You're, you're okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I said, okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure because I see you uh, looking at the prosecutor. He's still reading the paperwork. So now, when I walk away from him, he asks me. I walk far enough away that he has to ask me out loud, "Can I have that for a second? That's what the prosecutor asked me. I want him to hear. That's why I walk far enough away. So when he asks me, "Can I have it?" I turn around to him and I say, no, just one word, no. And I walk further away. Now, in the rules of court, you have to let your opponent see what you're getting ready to show the witness. But I'm not showing him yet. So you're not seeing it. When I said no, he does the next thing that I needed him to do. He objects and asks to approach the bench. Now, my witness is seeing all of this. He's seeing this commotion going back and forth. He's seeing the eye in back and forth. So he doesn't know what's going on, but he's witnessing there's a problem somewhere. He's playing in my hand. So we go to the bench. These are all details. These are these are utilizing minute details as very, very significant weapons without allowing your opponent to understand that you're actually doing that. He has no clue that he's my weapon, that this document and him is my weapon against the police. Now, the judge is going to be my next weapon. So he goes and he asks for a sidebar. The judge and, and goes and he calls the sidebar up. We go to the sidebar and he's telling the judge, judge, he's getting ready to show a, a privileged document. This is an inter-office memo from the prosecutor's office. He can't show that witness that document. That document is confidential. So the judge says, uh, well, Mr. Wright, yeah, work product in the prosecutor's office, you, you don't have any right to be showing a witness the document. I said, Your Honor, um, you're absolutely right. Um, would you like to see the document? He says, yes. So I give him the document. He's looking at it. He looks at me, looks at the prosecutor. He says, Mr. Wright, how did you get this document? Because he sees it. it's an inter-office memo from the head prosecutor. I'm serving a life sentence in prison. What the heck am I doing? with a document, an inner office memo from the prosecutor's office. So he's the judge, the first, first thing the judge asked me is, how did you get this document? So I said, your honor, prosecutor, this was a different process. This wasn't my head prosecutor. He sent his, his, his underling, you know, I was a nobody, go to handle that. He sent his underling, you know, to handle it, the first assistant, which is really the second in command. He sent them to handle it. So I said, your honor, um, Mr. Bissell, gave it to me in civil discovery. He copied it and he gave it to me. So the judge looks at the prosecutor. He says, if your office gave him this document, it's no longer privileged. 
well, what are you talking about? If, if it was confidential and privileged, you would have never gave it to him. He's got it. You gave it to him and there's nothing I could do about it. But your honor, it's still privileged. We, what are you asking me to do, prosecutor? This is what the judge says now. And this is important because remember, it was the judge that put on the record. The question's been asked and answered. He read no other files. It was the judge that did that. So the judge asks him, what is it that you're asking me to do, prosecutor? Are you are you telling me that you want me to prevent Mr. Wright from questioning this officer on the document? And he said over and over again that he's never read any of the files in this case. Is that what you're trying to get me to do now? Because now you what he's asking him, are you trying to put my head on a chopping block now? Mm. I've already gone on record saying it's been asked and answered. And this man didn't read any other reports. So the moment the prosecutor started to say something, he says, nope, you know what? Sit down. Mr. Wright, go ahead and continue to question your witnesses. You can use the document. So, and I'm going to make this quick. I'm going to end it by doing this. I approached the witness with the document. And I gave it to him. And I asked him to read it to himself. And when I approached him and asked him to read it to himself, I'm standing right next to him, like over him. I want, I want to crowd his space now. While he's reading that, I want to engulf him. I want to exert power over him, make him uncomfortable. So he's reading it. And as he's reading it, I'm seeing his Adam's apple trembling. I know now, okay, you know what's getting ready to come because you know what you just did. You're God's law enforcement officer. But now you just saw that I caught you in a lie. And that's the reason why I wanted him to read it to himself first. I just didn't want to come out and catch him. I wanted him to understand what was getting ready to happen. So, so let me explain just to, just to say it like this, right? When a person, I, I, I know you, you've probably heard this before and I know other people has probably experienced it. You have people that when they get afraid, they pee themselves. They're, they're, they, they lose control of some of their movements. Either it's urine, some of it's bowel. And the reason why that happens is because they sit in fear too long. When something happens quickly, the way your body reacts to fear is different. But when fear, when you're engulfed in fear too long, your nervous system begins to tie up on you. And so the reason why I wanted him to read it is because I wanted to engulf him in fear for a period of time to continue to weaken him. So he's reading it, his Adam's apple starts trembling and he's reading it too long. It's only a paragraph. I had to stop him and say, are you finished? You done? He says, yes. So I said, do you recognize your name on that document? His, his voice is trembling when he says yes. I said, okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to read that paragraph for the record out loud. He reads it and he's trembling as he's reading it. And when he finished, he says to, to all the detectives listed below, please read all the files in State versus Isaac Wright. Pass it down to the detective below you. Make sure you sign it and date it. That's what it said. So after he read it out loud, I says, you just said your name was on it. Did you sign that document? Y yes, Mr. Wright, I signed it. And you dated it, didn't you? Yes, I did. And before he could say anything else, I snatched the document out of his hand and walked away from him towards my table. By the time I got midway to the table, I turned around and I called him a liar. So you lied today. You're a liar, aren't you? Now, mind you, this is a detective of honor. And as I said to him, as I call him a liar, and he's explaining himself, no, Mr. Wright, I didn't. I said, yes, you did, because if you didn't lie today, you lied to the prosecutor. And as I'm talking to him, I'm taking my files out, my case files. Now I'm going to save him. He's in trouble. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to save him. And as he's trying to explain, I lay my file and right in front of him. And I say, redeem yourself. Tell the court what really happened. And I walked away from him. While I was walking away, I heard this scream. I've been holding this in for seven and a half years. And he started telling everything. It was that the, the, the hearings lasted a little bit longer, but. But after he finished, I knew at that point it was over.
It was, it, and, and, it, and it was, it was a snowball rolling down a hill. Every, everything came tumbling down. That confession was a prelude to the entire case falling apart. The prosecutor running the I mean, it was, it was, it was just, it was done. It was done. It's such an incredible story, man. Your, your fortitude, your resilience, your willingness to self-educate, to stand up for yourself, to fight a, an overwhelming odd and to never lose sight of where you're trying to end up and what you have to do to get there is one of the most breathtaking and inspiring stories I've ever heard, dude. Like this is just absolutely mind-blowingly amazing. And it's extraordinary to see that you've not only become a lawyer, but you've become one of the most sought after lawyers in America. Um, not only do you have an incredible life story, but it's been turned into an incredible TV show called For Life on ABC. Um, you know, not only that, but you're really trying to be a servant and bring Absolutely. your just deep wisdom and the way that you look at problem solving to a lot of people, man. It's, it is really breathtaking. Um, where can people follow along on your journey? Um, I mean, they can follow from a social media aspect. You know, it's, it's uh, Isaac Wright Jr. Uh, at Isaac Wright Jr. Um, that's my, that's my personal uh, social media handle. And, you know, everything's there. I lay out my life on social media, the things I'm doing on a daily basis, some of the things that I've gone through, uh, some of the things that's going to happen. And then you have my campaign uh, website, um, which is www.writefornyc2021. Uh, you can sign up there. You can join. You can, you know, you can donate. You can follow the campaign, um, uh, and you can, you know, ask questions. Uh, there's a there's another site, and I think this site is significant, but it's it's specifically for people in New York called Forgiveness NYC. It's dealing with a policy issue that I have uh, to forgive as mayor. When I become mayor, I'm going to be forgiving uh, those. Uh, those people that are, are renters that are facing um, eviction and those that are facing foreclosure because of COVID, um, um, I'm, I'm looking to put them in, in in forgiveness programs where all those debts are going to be forgiven. They start with their landlords and their mortgage companies are new, and we make the landlords and, and the mortgage companies uh, whole so that they don't take losses. Uh, I think that's going to keep thousands and thousands of people um, off the off from off the street. Uh, it's going to keep thousands and thousands and thousands of people in their home. Uh, it's going to give them some comfort and some security and, and allow them to move forward in life without the anxiety of what's going to happen to them and their family tomorrow. And so that's forgiveness.nyc. They can start signing up now in preparations for me uh, taking this office of mayor and giving it back to the people uh, and getting New York City back, uh, you know, back on its feet. I love it. Guys, trust me, the more time you spend with Isaac, the more it will melt your brain in terms of what is possible, what all of us can do if we take control of our own lives. If instead of getting angry or bitter, we turn that into action, we figure out how the game works, and then we just play it better than anybody else. I mean, it really is such an extraordinary tale. And speaking of things that are extraordinary, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Each and every day I'm looking at, at, at the blessings that have, that, have, that have come. Now look, there's no way in hell I would have signed up for this, right? <laughs> like, I, there's, I, like, not at all. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't definitely, nah, I wouldn't have gave up, you know, like, all of my 20s, essentially, you know, mm -hmm. for, for this. Um, not at all.